You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. This is the Catholic Family Podcast. I'm Kevin Davis, and I'm very happy to be back with a show with three of my very good friends, three good priest friends of mine, Father Heine, Father Borja, and Father Geckel. Thank you all so very much for coming on. Today, we're going to talk about a very hopefully a very uplifting topic. And I've had some some people who listen to the show email me and ask if we could cover depression or talk about things about how, how do we overcome, yeah, being down in the dumps or feeling feeling sad that the world is crazy. How do we how do we have happiness and joy in our lives? And, and it's not something we really want to cover too much going into depression, but we want to talk about joy and happiness and, and what is true joy and true happiness. And today I'm very happy to be joined by these three priests where we hope we can solve this problem a little bit, I suppose, or make it a little more simple for people to, to see what is happiness. And at the end, we're going to give some practical ways to help to achieve that goal here on earth. And Father Heiner, we're going to send it straight to you if you would. Um, recently, you had a sermon here in, in, in near Munich, Germany. You're my parish priest, for those who don't know. And you talked about this topic a little bit. So I, I'd love if you could start a little bit about, you know, what, what is true happiness, I suppose? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. And um, I would like the main thought that I would like to contribute here is uh, that um, what is kind of tricky about, I think, true happiness is that we find it only if we don't seek it directly. And this is um, um, something that, like Jesus, I think, meant when he said, like, if you lose your life, you will gain it and uh, this is something that is maybe difficult for modern men to understand sometimes um, that uh, we find happiness only if we don't seek it directly and we find it mostly in the opposite uh, direction kind of by self-sacrifice you know if we uh, give ourselves up if we sacrifice ourselves and um and don't seek ourselves and this is very difficult and um, we i think we often notice that even if we think that we acted in a, with a pure intention um, if we look closer then we always find something where we again look for ourselves or often i think and this is uh, there's a lot of room for for progress, spiritual progress, maybe especially now during Lent, maybe this is very fitting also here during Lent, that we learn to become more pure in our intention, meaning pure intention, pure intention, meaning um, that we don't, we do the uh, things out of pure love for God, and not for seeking ourselves. And um, for me, I think this is kind of the most important um, thing um, to remember when we talk about true happiness that we uh, find it in uh, self-sacrifice. And, and so the, the true happiness is is something that we can't really achieve if we're looking for it kind of is what you're saying because because I guess then father what, what is what is true happiness? I, I guess that's that's the ultimate question. What, what is that on earth? Is there an answer to that question I suppose or one of the other priests maybe you could answer? I mean, what it is, um, I think we find it in uh, in fulfilling the desire of our soul. Um, this would be the most logic thing. Um, and our soul comes from God. So we find this, Saint, as St. Saint Augustine says, um, we, we are, our soul is restless until it rests in God. So we find this true happiness only in uh, going back to the source of where where we come from and where our ultimate goal lies you know and this is by the way again interesting because sometimes when you talk about faith about religion then people often ask you you know what what does it give me you know what is what does it gain from this faith or what does it gain what do i gain get from going to church or whatever and I think here again, like we said before, it's not uh, seeking ourselves. And I think the important thing is to understand about the faith is not primarily to find something for ourselves, but to, uh, to know that there is a God 
and to get in connection with God and then in a, in a loving relationship to God to see that he loves me and I love him. And then from this, we get true happiness. But it's not a primarily seeking happiness for myself. Um, this would be a very egotistic relationship. And just like in, in any friendship or relationship, um, we don't find happy a happy relationship or happiness when we seek ourselves, because that that destroys every 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 relationship and every happiness. And we find the happiness only if we um, if we give ourselves up, if we um, achieve this self sacrifice, the self surrender. And I would add, our divine Lord tells us, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. So like you're saying, Father, just that whole aspect of it means not so much what can I give, what can I find for myself, but what can I um, do for our Lord? You know, and our Lord tells us to deny ourselves and follow him. Yeah. And is that something that, that I, I mean, I think Catholics know these things, but they still, maybe they wake up in the morning and they think, okay, today... I'm not feeling it, you know. I'm not feeling that that motivation, that desire, that that passion to to take up the cross. I suppose, and obviously that's that's an emotional reaction. I suppose. I mean, is that something that we should we should take as part of the cross? I suppose, as knowing, hey, it's hard, and so know it's hard, and that's why you take it up. Yeah, I think that yeah. that could be a, um, also a kind of a. <laughs> a help, a psychological help to learn not to listen too much to those um, feelings or, or moods that we often find ourselves in. And I think um, and uh, I think that could be also like a resolution for Lent to do what you have planned to do, for example, um, and, th and, and learn it start not listening so much to whether you are in the mood for it or not. And um, that uh, that helps, I think, to uh, to be more steady and also be more uh, above the feelings that can always change. Yeah, I read St. Thomas Aquinas earlier said happiness is secured through virtue. It is a good attained by man's own will, which I think mm -hmm. is exactly as you say, Father. It's, it's attained by will. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good. That's a good point. Good. Maybe. Sorry, Father. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I know I was, that's all. I was just I mean, going to say that. Uh, Father Gecko, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, um, no, I, I, I was just going to say it. Um, it fits in so perfectly that, you know, we find happiness and holiness. And, you know, what is holiness but going after God or living a good life, um, seeking after goodness, which ultimately is God, but um, it's in virtue um, that we find happiness. Um, seeking after good, having the will to seek after good, um, it, 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 not not depending on whether we feel like it or not, or whether we have the mood. Um, when you know the angels told the shepherds at Bethlehem that you know the Messiah was born, they said, "Peace to men of good will." And if we will to seek after what is good, that that means good will, right? So if we're trying to do good and willing it whether we feel like it or not, um, then we're going to be happy, more happy anyway, even if we have a lot of crosses. And um, yeah, say, uh, it just kind of jogged my memory at the St. Thomas Aquinas being asked, you know, what does it take to become a saint, you know, li live a holy life? And um, he said, will it, just will it, um, and we'll become saints. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say. It's, I think that's a good point with the with the will aspect. I I um, I think that's very important to emphasize, and that's um, I think sometimes it can also help us psychologically to overcome those um, those moods that we are more um, that we are aware that happiness is is a, is a, can be a, or come comes from our will act because sometimes we we feel that we are kind of a um, uh, uh, victim of our our uh, feelings but um, that I think and that's what the world today tells us you know to uh, if you feel that way then that's the way it is 
but I think we are much more freer than that um, and practicing our will. And that's again what we are um, here able to do during uh, Lent to practice our will and even to overcome our our those feelings. And this is what kind of we can say about true happiness too, that it is more than this um, happiness. Maybe you could talk, call it joy or something, like something that's higher than just happiness. Um, the joy meaning like true happiness that is um, filling us with uh, hope and faith and charity and love and is a result of our will act. So I think that's very good uh, that you uh, that we mentioned this um, will aspect about this whole thing here. Well, and I wonder too, when, when, when people, even when they are happy in this earth, you know, I, I wonder for myself too, when, when do I feel that emotional happiness when i say happy you know that the happiness of you know the, the pleasure of feeling good i suppose and I, I guess you had to ask when does that happen i mean and is it because of you did something right you know is it because you achieved something is, is it because you you i don't know ate a good cookie you know whatever it is i mean and, and i think that but that's an interesting question because because then if if you really come down to the root of what makes you even happy on earth, then then what's actually going to make you happy, you know, eventually truly. Yeah. I mean, you, I think you could, you could say from our own experience that there's internal things and then external things that make you happy, right? If you're having your favorite food or around your favorite friends or listening to your favorite music, things like that, those are external things that, give you that satisfaction. Um, then you have internal things like, you know, if you do good for some someone or you sacrifice, give something to someone, or if you do a lot of hard work and you accomplish some goal, um, that's kind of an internal thing. Um, and so external things can kind of give us the, the satisfaction or the high or the happy, some sort of happiness, but it's it's dependent on those external things. Whereas if you are developing, like Father was saying, joy, um, that's like a happiness that's internal, it's lasting. And that doesn't, you you can't hang on to that without a lot of willpower. So I mean like, um, almost like a satisfaction from doing good kind of. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, came, that came to mind when Kevin, you said this with the cookie, you know, that um, I, uh, often when you have to do um, something that is kind of tough or um, that you're kind of afraid of maybe even before and then you do it and it might take some some time or some days and you look forward to a day of rest afterwards and you are really happy when you, when you come out of this mission or whatever um, but then the day of rest is kind of almost like it doesn't give you that satisfaction. I mean, it's necessary and you you get the satisfaction again because you tell yourself, okay, I need this to recreate and to get my strength back. But um, like wearing oneself out for a higher purpose is almost more, more rewarding um, than uh, maybe uh, doing something that you just enjoy yourself. And uh, that if, if you, if you, keep that aspect of like doing even the joy, the, the rec recreational stuff out of love for God, then you already also do this thing for a high purpose. So maybe it is whether you have a higher purpose, what you do the things for or not, you know, that might be an aspect that um, uh, uh, adds a lot to your, to the reward that you feel or the joy uh, that you feel. And I would add just ultimately, I think that, everything that should be driving us should be the love of God, right? And, and we read in scripture that uh, whether you eat or drink, or whatever else you do, do all for the love of God. And like you're saying, Father, just having that that uh, motive, so to say, that higher uh, purpose for doing what we do. And in doing so, I think that's where you're going to find that happiness and that peace and that joy. And, and so, I mean, in today's day and age, and probably all throughout history, there's there's a lot of evil and bad going on in the world in in society in everyone's lives life's tough right it's it's not meant to be easy i suppose and and so i guess you know if someone wakes up in the morning and they think okay I, i'm not happy 
I, but I want to be happy and I want to do, I want to do the right things. And I want to feel it. What's the advice as, as, for me, it, it, it comes down to get away from the feeling and go back to the will, which I think several of you have said also, I mean, you have to will that it's going to be better, I suppose. Is, is that right? I mean, how do they, they get up in the morning and say, okay, I don't feel good, but. I do it anyways, kind of. <laughs> well, and perspective, perspective mm -hmm. changes everything. It, it, if you're doing it for the high motive of the love of God, or if you're doing it to glorify God in some way, whether you're um, cleaning the dishes or doing laundry or whether you're building a church, if you're doing it for a good motive and you have that bigger perspective of I'm doing this for God, I'm doing this for um, my creator, et cetera, for the love of him, then it, uh, whether you feel good about it or not, whether you get up in the morning and you really don't want to do it, it's still, you can still hang on to that perspective of I'm doing this for a good reason. And um, I'm not seeking my own satisfaction in this. I'm seeking to please God. Um, and, that perspective changes everything. If you have somebody, you know, if you have a, a, like, for example, a married couple and, you know, if their perspective is that I'm doing this for my husband or my wife, and they're really trying to do their best with keeping the house clean or with their work or saving money, whatever it is, if they're doing it for that purpose, they are going to feel happier because they, they love each other. Um, whether it's enjoyable or not, a lot of those, day-to-day -day duties are not very fun it's not very pleasant you don't feel like doing it every day but you're doing it for your family for your children for your husband or wife and that makes it rewarding in and of itself and gives you more peace and happiness whereas if you're just going through the day because you have to do this and it's just you're focusing on the the feeling or the, the here and now satisfaction that you get from it it's you'd be pretty miserable because most things that we do every day don't really satisfy us. It's why we're doing it is bigger than what we're doing, why we're doing it. Well, it kind of all goes back to that intention that father was talking about. I like that. I like that, uh, that, um, putting things into perspective because, um, that gives, like you said, father, and I think that's, that might be also a help because that gives those seemingly insignificant actions that we do a, a, a true value and therefore also our inner, inner reward um, that I don't have if I if I don't consider. And, and that's maybe a, uh, also something like Kevin, when you say you wake up and stuff like that, that sometimes you have to reflect a little bit more. Um, because if you don't do this thinking like Father just said, um, then you don't appreciate those little things and, or you don't see their value. And uh, here again, this is what our faith, uh, we see the value of our faith that teaches us those things, you know, or meditation or reading good books um, where they tell us those things that, hey, even those little, little daily things that are very burdensome sometimes and seem to have no no um, significance in a, on a higher scale they are um, to put them in, into the right perspective and that gives them um, a value that is worth working for you know i i think that's a very good aspect here yeah definitely and, and i think that it's 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 a it's a good time to to bring up some of the practical ways of handling this i suppose and i guess actually before we do father father heine mentioned before the show quotes about saints especially that um that live joyfully and i think that's that's a really important thing to remember too that that i think when i when i think of saints oftentimes i think of you know monks and abbots and you know very dark dungy it, it's kind of what what comes to my mind sometimes which is unfortunate but especially some of the saints were very probably most of them were very joyful very happy people i don't think they went around with scowls on their faces they went around with with happiness and joy and they spread that happiness and joy and I imagine it it was probably not always easy. I, I don't want to say they were acting, but I mean, how much of that did they have to actively say, you know, I'm going to live joyfully? Or was it something that came 
more so from their love of God? You know, what I mean, I, I, I don't know how to phrase the question. Is it is it because the, were they happy only because they loved God, or did, were they was it kind of both working at the same time? I suppose. I'd say, like, I'd say here we see um, the um, joy. They didn't maybe have this loud happiness of that the world is sometimes pretending but they had this deeper joy you know and uh, i think that's what we are looking for um this lasting joy and that came from um from their relation to god and their closeness to god and their love of god and knowing that god loves them and uh when you talk about happiness here, I think one one saying that specifically comes to mind that is famous almost for his almost uh, yeah, for his cheerfulness was Philip Saint Philip Neri, who's also called um, it's um, in German uh, it's I forgot the word but he's like the almost the clown of God or the the, the laughing uh, the laughing saint I think we say the right? laughing saint think, yeah, something yeah. like that I forgot the exact like that, yeah. Term. Yeah. Um, and here, he's, he once said, the true way to advance in holy virtues is to persevere in a holy cheerfulness. And that brings up a completely different aspect now that we um, also tell ourselves, hey, I, I want to be cheerful because it helps me to be better. Because it's, if we are cheerful, if we are happy, that uh, makes being good much easier. And so maybe sometimes we have to force ourselves or to, uh, to yeah, to, to overcome ourselves and, and be happy. And um, then uh, then it kind of drives, drives itself, you know. And something similar was said by St. Francis of Assisi. He said, let us leave sadness. I have the quote here. Let us leave sadness to the devil and his angels as for us. What can we be but rejoicing and glad? Here we see, I think that makes it pretty, pretty uh, puts it pretty nicely that um, sadness can also be sometimes a mean um, uh, a means of the devil to to pull us down and to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, like a sort of temptation, and that can tell that can help us uh, or if we understand that that helps us to uh, to understand that we sometimes have to actively counteract this um, mood that we sometimes find ourselves in and think of, hey, if I really think what I already received from God or that I know God and that there is a God and that this infinite and eternal God loves me and is close to me, then what else can I be? But like he said, but rejoicing and glad. So maybe this is kind of a... a a summary of the attitude of the saints and their outlook on on this uh, topic. No, I didn't, that's really what's. Oh, so go ahead, Father. Yeah. No, you have Saint Paul say, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Mm. And I I think of the the from the Psalms. I believe this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And um, you know, for the longest time, I had on my ringtone for the morning um, was the. Uh, was the king singers singing the Hic Diaz as okay. a reminder to me, like, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So. It's a great way to hate that particular song. That, this is true. <laughs> Waking up to that. Be happy. Rejoice. <laughs> you got to start somehow, Father. No, it's true. And it's it's really interesting, too. I think even even just the, the cheerfulness that that even if we – try to smile it makes us happier it, it tricks our brains into it too our, our 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 brains and our psyches are pretty interesting things that if we try it usually works and, and i think it's a good place to go over to father borja we want to talk about practical ways of yeah you know trying to help if things are rough or feeling down what what brings joy happiness or spiritual up you know being uplifted and father borja I, I asked you to come up with a book or two that, that might help people or that you find helpful. Yeah, well, in regards to um, spiritual reading, I think that's an important aspect of keeping our focus before our minds uh, in realizing what we're trying to accomplish uh, in this world. And uh, Tinkery in his spiritual life gave 
several exterior means of, per of perfection. And obviously our striving for perfection is striving to know, love and serve God in this world so that we can be happy with him in the next. And I just, when I think about spiritual reading, I think that's a really important part of our spiritual lives and of our advancing in virtue, growing in our love for God. And it's something that should be a part of, of people's basic spiritual exercises in their daily day lives. And St. John Bosco, he mentioned that only God knows the good that can come about by reading one good Catholic book. And it's just, like I said, the spiritual benefit that one can reap in uh, from good, good spiritual reading books is, is immense. Um, you know, I wanted to quote a couple of saints. Uh, St. Alphonso Liguori said that without good books and spiritual reading, it would be morally impossible to save our souls. Uh, St. Gregory says that spiritual books are like a mirror which God places before us in order that we may see ourselves, correct our faults, and adorn ourselves with virtue. And uh, St. Bernard says that spiritual reading and prayer are the arms by which hell is conquered and paradise won. And St. Jerome says that when we, when we pray, we speak to God, but when we read, God speaks to us. And like I said, I think that's just some really good important things to keep in mind when it comes to um, spiritual reading. And you think about, for example, in the lives of the saints, just the impact that it made on them. Think of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, he wasn't leading the greatest of lives, and then he got um, wounded on the battlefield, and he was in a hospital bed uh, recovering, and he was pretty bored, and someone gave him a, a book on the lives of the saints. And we read in, his, in, um, in, in the life of St. Ignatius that after he was finished reading that book, he was on fire uh for for god and he you know he cried it's said that he cried out if dominic could do it uh so can i if francis can do it uh so can i and so he was just inflamed by by the the reading of of the lives of the saints we think about saint augustine and how he heard a voice saying tole lege tole lege which means take and read take and read and it is said that he opened up the scriptures to one of the epistles of St. Paul, I believe it was the epistle to the Romans, uh, chapter 13, verse 13, and it said, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in debauchery and impurities, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put, ye, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh and its concupiscences. And we know St. Augustine from lead, leading a very wayward life um, converted. He saw the true state of his soul and he was able to implement changes and, and obviously change his life around and do great things for God. So obviously that uh, are some examples that by which we can be inspired and encouraged by. And when it comes to spiritual reading, there's different aspects. You know, first and foremost, the spiritual writers say that one should focus, uh, the specific focus should be on the reading of Holy Scripture, especially uh, the New Testament. So that should hold first place in regards to spiritual reading. And the reason for that is that in the New Testament, we see and we read the teachings and the example of our Lord. And there's no better, better school of, of solid piety than to learn and imitate our divine model, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's where the scriptures and the gospels are a great means to nourish ourselves, to be inspired by the example of Christ and to really take to heart his teachings. Um, and when it comes to the Old Testament, it you know it can be not as as easy to get through that and, and not as not not so much recommended. Um, but there is a part, one of the books of the of the Old Testament that are that is highly recommended, and that is the book of King David or the Psalms of King David. And the church considers that to be one of the most excellent prayer books uh, that we have at our disposal. And as we know, the priests have to pray from the divine office, and that is, you know, the Psalms of, of King David. And it's just, like I said, a great uh, prayer book. And it's recommended to read through the Psalms and reread it, read and reread it as a means to uh, sanctify ourselves. But after that, after the New Testament, the Gospels, um, or it's scripture, then you have, you know, doctrinal masters uh, on the spiritual life, you know, the spiritual writers. 
um, especially have the saints uh, that that uh, come to mind. I think of Saint Alphonsus, Saint Francis de Sales, and uh, and when it comes to for ourselves picking a a work on the spiritual life, I think it's important that we talk to our spiritual directors to see what's best suited for our state of soul, because you know you can get a beginner who wants to read uh, from Saint John of the Cross and you know lofty mystical theology there, and and uh, it might not be the best thing for them at that time, um, you know, can be pretty, pretty lofty. And so that's where going to a spiritual director and asking for guidance and, um, and what is best suited for our souls. And then obviously get into the uh, reading of the lives of the saints. But that's, that's um, something that we, we keep in mind in regards to our spiritual reading is that there's a method that we should go about. And St. Alfonso Zagori gives a, a, some principles and an a, and specific attitude that we should have when it comes to spiritual reading. But St. Alfonso Zagori says that before we actually get into spiritual reading, we should ask God for help. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, it's through reading that God speaks to us. And as we read in the Old Testament, Samuel said, Lord, speak Lord for your servant uh, is listening. And that should be, so to say, our, our mindset, you know, speak, Lord, I'm here, I'm your servant, and I'm listening. And so God, you know, like I said, speaks to us through means of our spiritual reading. And so asking that help beforehand to be receptive and open to that. Um, and then he says the next thing or attitude should be is that the purpose for, our sp for the spiritual reading is to advance in love of God. It's not to acquire learning or to indulge in our curiosity. But um, it's to sincerely desire, to sincerely strive after sanctifying ourselves. And then he goes on to say that we should try to read slowly with attention uh, because that spiritual reading should be like nourishment to our souls. And when we eat, you know, we want to make sure that we properly chew our food and uh, et cetera, and that we assimilate it. And that's the same with our spiritual reading. We want to make sure that we, so to say, chew it, we ponder it and reflect on it and so that it can spiritually nourish our souls. Um, and then lastly, he says that we should take something away from our spiritual reading, some sort of sentiment, some sort of uh, sentiment of devotion that we can carry away and reflect and, and remind ourselves uh, during the day uh, or during our work, etc. So the couple of principles and that, that St. Alphonso Ligori gives in regards to uh, spiritual reading. But for myself, I kind of came up with a list. There's tons of Good spiritual reading books out there but for uh, myself a couple that i've really enjoyed uh, is trustful surrender to divine providence by father jean baptiste and it has a short short section uh, by blessed claude de, de colombier um, but it's it's really good book small book but i've read and reread it many times and i'd like to encourage that book uh, trustful surrender to divine providence the uh, secret to happiness and holiness that i've that I've uh, enjoyed is called How to Profit by Our Faults by um, Joseph Tissot. And um, so those are maybe more uh, doctrinal works, but then there's also Lives of the Saints um, that are really good. There's a book called Kingdom and a Cross by St. Alphonso Ligori. We have The Story of a Soul, the Autobiography of St. Therese of Lisieux, Saints for Sinners by uh, Bishop Goodyear, uh, The Great Magdalens by Monsignor Hugh Francis, um, you have the, uh, the, the saga of Sato by Father Raymond, who talks to the three religious rebels, the family that overtook Christ, um, the burnt out incense. And uh, then you have some more good, some other doctrinal works, um, imitation of Christ, obviously being very good, uh, introduction to devout life, et cetera. So these are just a few of the many good books that are out there for spiritual reading. And if, if Father, if you going back to the original topic if you wake up one morning you feel you feel in the dumps you feel like this is going to be a bad day what what book what book should you go to and say okay this this is the the one i want to read I, and it, let's say it, take out the new testament because i guess that that's probably the first but say other than that it doesn't he doesn't feel it when he has this he has a song on his phone so he doesn't feel it <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Father. <laughs> so for anyone else who, who might, you know, wake up not feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I recommend um, the trustful surrender to divine providence just because when we, he just he really goes to show just how everything that happens throughout the day is allowed and, and permitted by almighty God. He, he gives the example of even the fly that's buzzing around your ear. It's annoying you and, you know, it's kind of aggravating. He said, that's, that's divine providence that God is allowing that for you to grow in virtue for you to um, practice some sort of, of a virtue and to remind yourself of, of, um, of humility, of, of calling God's presence, etc. So that's, that's my go-to. So that's what I would recommend. Great. Father, I know you have it. Or Father Gekko, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, imitation of Christ sometimes is really, really awesome. Um, to just pull that out and read a short section, a page or two. And um, it's just so insightful and kind of goes back to the um, idea of perspective. The um, giving that perspective by reading it, by getting it into your head again about why you're doing this, why you're going through all the chores and stuff. And um, yeah, imitation of Christ is really good for that. Perfect. Father Heine, do you have one? Uh, yeah, Father basically mentioned, I, I think the one I read the most um, was um, the autobiography of St. Teresa of Lisieux. Mm -hmm. Right now, actually, when I'm driving, I listen to um, the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila that I accidentally um, came across uh, on YouTube. There's a uh, somebody reading it in English, actually. I didn't find a German version. And this is really, really something else. I mean, he is, uh, she is really uh, enthusiastic about the whole thing. And uh, I could recommend that right now, um, amongst other things. But this is what I'm listening to right now um, a lot and enjoying it a lot, in at least the English version. That's great. No, and I think that as as Father Borja so so well said, I think it's it is such an important part of our lives, and it's so easy to lose. I mean, in in, in the world of technology, in the world of television, and and Facebook, and Twitter, and and life, I suppose it's so easy. I'm speaking for myself. I mean, I, I fortunately in Lent, Lent forces me to do it, but I, I I fall so far away from from reading from spiritual reading during the normal year. It's it's terrible. And I had to, I kind of wait until Lent to do it again, and then here I am again. And so I hope I'll continue after Lent. I really have to force myself to do it. Can I just add one thing to that about Perfect. reading? Is is um, you know, everybody's different, and there's a lot of different types of reading. There's a lots of different kind of schools of thought or ways of going about things. Like there's some people that really really love to read San Alfonso Sigori, and there's others like myself. I find it much more difficult to read. Even though he's a saint, he has a certain way of going about in his writings that it's harder for me to uh, get into. Other people really like things that Jesuits have written because they have a more methodical, straight to the point way of going about it. Dominicans might be more lofty. Franciscans might be. They're they're different. They all have a different kind of approach, and you know, some people might be given a book and they're told this is really really good. You're going to love this book. It's helped me out so much, and they read it and they can't get through it. Hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that all spiritual reading is no good or that you can't read or you're never going to get anything out of it. It's like, well, look around, try different books because you might find something that is absolutely life-changing. Um, when I was a freshman, um, homeschooled that year, and one of the required reading books was uh, Fabiola. And most people wouldn't think that that's this crazy intellectual or crazy deep spiritual book. But for me at that time, at that age, in that place, that made the faith come alive and really real for, you know, as, as a teenager for the first time in my life, I, it changed so much. Um, other people, I've, I've given that book to other people to read and they say, oh, they didn't really like it that much. But for me at that time, it was amazing. Um, so, um, yeah, there's so many different types of books, so many t different types of authors that um, different people get more from. So just something to keep in mind. Right. And, and as Father Borja said, too, probably speak with your spiritual director when it comes to the especially the more lofty things. But but, yeah, try things out. And and I know there are reading lists out there. I mean, maybe I'll have to try to see if I can find a good uh, spiritual reading um, list or at least one of, of novels and, and, and young young adult literature that, that, are, that I know exist. I'll try to link that to this podcast because there, there are excellent books out there. Sometimes they're hard to find. 
Um, but but they they do exist, and as as Father Gecko says, they they can one of them can have a huge effect on on you. Um, and Father Gecko, I'd, I'd like to send it to you. We we have a few minutes left to go in the show, and we kind of left you for last in kind of an, an inter a, a not a hard topic, but but going into prayer now and talking about prayer in terms of how do you use the prayer life and what literal prayers do you use in order to help attain yeah earthly happiness mm -hmm. yeah um it's a big topic but i think just to cut to the chase i think what father uh, borjo is saying about you know trustful surrender to divine, divine providence and seeing god's will and everything is in and of itself a prayer an exercise of the will um to seek after god's will and not your own um and it goes back to what father heine was saying about you know we find that happiness not directly it, it, it when we see god's will in our life and we realize that everything that's happening is god's will and we remind ourselves of that continually you know turning our will to god you know not my will but thine be done or um, some similar prayer just even if it's a moment it brings our mind back to that perspective of this is what god wants of me right now here and now or this day um so i'm going to do it my as best as i can and just like the muscles of our body aren't don't get stronger if we don't use them so our will it's really weak unless we exercise it and that that mindset of doing god's will is something you have to work towards and exercise and the more you do it the more easy it becomes so i think um that's kind of at the top of my list of, of things with, that are really practical um is just to remind yourself over and over again when things are going bad or when you're struggling with something or you get up in the morning and you don't want to move um is, this is god's will this is what god wants of me that is really helpful um um uh, another another really practical thing for those who do have a church where they can go to um, where the Blessed Sacrament is kept is to spend time with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, there's uh, as one priest told me, you know, the closer you are to the fire, the warmer you're going to be. Um, and if we go to Christ there in the Blessed Sacrament, I mean, he tells us himself, you know, come to me, all you who are labor, who labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. Um, that's we, we use that quote from scripture and apply it to the blessed sacrament. I mean, so perfectly. Um, and if we spend more time with our Lord, I, how are we not going to become more at peace, have a, you know, a greater desire to please God, to do God's will, spend more time at church visiting with our Lord. And whether that is, you know, actually reading, you know, formal prayers or whether that's just, um, you know, trying to have some form of meditation or if it's just sitting there and thinking and just spending time with Christ, um, it's it can be life changing. It can be huge, um, and we all none of us none of us appreciate it as we should, of course. Um, but if we realize that Christ is really here, you know, how, how is that not going to help us? Um, so that's that's huge. You know, Saint Ignatius of Loyola said that you know if. You know, as we know, he founded the Jesuit order and he's, he said at one point that if his entire order, if he knew that his entire order was being destroyed and um, totally lost, he said, if I spent 15 minutes with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, I'd be totally at peace with it completely. Um, so huge, uh, can be a huge help there. And, and then the last thing I think I wanted to say um, is to frequently make acts of faith, hope and charity. Um Again, I'm repeating it, <laughs> perspective. Um, our faith is something that we have to constantly bring back to our minds um, and apply it to our day-to-day -day life. And just that act of faith, what we say in that prayer reminds us that you know God is real. This isn't just a feeling. He's real. It's, it, it's <laughs> whether I feel like it or whether I like it, it's real. And I believe it and I will it. I will to believe it. Likewise, with uh, act of hope, you make that act of hope that you rely on God. Maybe you're having a hard time. Maybe you're struggling to see how a certain thing could be God's will. Act of hope. 
I trust that this is what is best. I rely on you to help me to do what I need to do, what you to practice this virtue or to get through that hardship, whatever. Um, relying on God. I mean, if we, if we have a strong hope, you know, there's not a whole lot that can kind of shake us. It gives us a strong foundation. And then, of course, again, active charity frequently. You know, if you if you love God, if you keep reminding yourself that I want to love God, I don't love him enough, but I will to and I want to. And this is how I prove it. It doesn't necessarily have to be that exact form, the formal prayer. But even if it's just a moment, a second or two where you lift your mind and your heart to God with that disposition, that sentiment, that mindset where you purify your intention, um, you see God's will in it. And then you you exercise your will to embrace it with that perspective that our faith gives us. So, um, yeah, those those are. In short, I guess, some very, very practical things that I think would be really helpful in achieving greater peace and happiness in life. That's very nice, Father. Father, Father Heine, do you have any any to add to that? Um, not to add. I, I just liked how Father, how Father said with the uh, that that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think of prayer, the importance of um, uh, spiritual, uh, me mental prayer. Or spiritual prayer or whatever we call it i mean like when you just sit and i think even i mean for those who are a little bit further away from the placid sacrament i think that can be also done of course it's nice in front of the placid sacrament but it course can also be done at home and i would like uh, like just like father said basically encourage everybody to practice that every day 10 or 15 minutes this um mental prayer um, that can that can even consist some people don't know what to talk then but to say then and uh, i read somewhere recently um this is actually prayer is actually just enjoying the presence of the beloved i, I think that was actually in with saint Teresa of avila in that autobiography and that i think uh, sums sums up the the essence of mental prayer i think that even if we don't have to say anything or don't know what to say um just if you if you have a good friend you like to visit him spend some time with him whatever you know uh, so we also can be with god just spending spending time with him um, and thinking that he's there and um, and enjoying his presence perfect father borja i know you have to go here in the next few minutes so we'll, we'll wrap the show up soon and, and, and if you could tell me then what you think uh, what your last words are in prayer and we'll we'll, we'll end the show and the other father said it said it very nicely in the aspect of it's just I when I think of prayer I think of I can't remember if it was Saint John Vianney who said um, or there was an instance where he saw a man sitting in church and uh, he noticed that he would he would he just he was there and um, you know and he saw him again the next day and he asked him you know what what are you praying when you're in church and the man just said I look at him and he looks at me. And it was just like Father Heine was saying, just that aspect of, of that spending that time with with your beloved, with with the one person that you should love the most above all things. And um, I just remember that just making an impression. And um, mm -hmm. like Father was saying, just having that that wanting to be with God, wanting to be in His presence. And even if you're not in front of the Blessed Sacrament, we know that our Lord. God is with us and that we can place ourselves in his presence at any time and any moment of the day. Perfect. Fathers, I think that's a great place to end. Um, I really appreciate you all coming on and having this conversation, talking about happiness, spiritual reading and prayer. Um, I'd like anyone who watches, please like, share and subscribe. Um, you can support the show on Patreon. And please, I want to attach a link to the um, Modern Day Seminary um, donation website. They are in always in need of money they have many seminarians that continue to pour in and search for their vocations to the priesthood they first of all need your prayers as do all the priests of course but they also need money to survive and to build bigger buildings and houses and, and all sorts of things that i'm sure the bishop is always planning at one time or another so they, they need your help i will attach that link to this um podcast and please um give your money to these good seminarians and good priests and the good bishop. So fathers, thank you again so much. And until next time, God bless. You've been listening to the Catholic family podcast. 
If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. At Majorum de Gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.